I will uh, I'll share my presentation in the chat. I also uh, I'm sharing uh, the QR code. You can take into you can reuse it. And the first disclaimer I have to make is that I'm not really an expert on open science. I deal with practical aspects of op uh, of uh, open licenses and copyright. Uh, so I'm not a legal expert, and all I know is from the perspective of a librarian, research librarian, supporting uh, researchers in their work, uh, in dealing with publishers, in uh, sharing their works, uh, data and publications and repositories, and in the process of the implementation of open science. So that's uh, my expertise, and I know these practical aspects. Uh, as for legal advice, I could probably provide some basic legal advice, but for some tricky issues, I wouldn't be able to uh, to do this. Uh, so I, I'm not sure whether you're. I'm in full screen, and you can see it properly or not. No. Yes, it's okay. So uh, I will probably. I won't probably be able to see uh, your hands raised, but please do interrupt if you have questions. So we are quite quite flexible with this presentation, and, and the aim is to explain stuff and not just for me to present uh, what I what I know to tell you. Uh, so if I don't see your hand raised, Dragona, please just turn on your mic and interrupt me with any questions. That's the main purpose to discuss this, and yeah, not to be just you know me talking uh basically i will start with some uh with some definitions of um, uh, related to to copyright and actually the the first definition is the definition of the intellectual property rights we're usually using the term copyright when speaking in english which is not uh entirely um it's not very inclusive and it has a quite a limited definition so if we talk about the creations of uh, human minds then it's the right term to use is the intellectual property rights so these are the rights that are related to, this is the definition from the uh, world in uh, intellectual property organization so these are the uh, the creations of uh, human minds and uh, usually it's the uh, author the person who the creator of these works this could be various types of works text uh, artworks uh, multimedia all sorts of uh, all sorts of media uh, so once they are created and once they are made public uh, the the owner uh, the original owner of the rights to use uh, these works is their author. So this is something that is very important and this is something that is too easily forgotten, uh, for example, in scholarly publishing, where people erroneously assume that the the, the publisher is the automatically uh, the copyright rights owner. So it's not so. So if you create a work uh, uh, and you publish it, it ca can be a book, but it can also be something published on the internet. Uh, it's basically your work and you decide how this work can be used. So you, you own all the rights, you own the exclusive rights, and you can give some rights to the others. You can retain all the rights for yourself. You can sell these rights a part of these rights i'll sh show it later and basically copyright uh, basically intellectual property rights includes uh, copyrights and rights related to copyright sometimes also called neighboring rights and industrial property so we won't be dealing with industrial property it's much more complicated these are patents it's uh, brands etc so we won't be talking about this because this is really not not that relevant to to your work uh, and to what you need uh, in dealing in, with digital humanities topics so copyright is actually one uh, segment of intellectual property rights and these are uh, it, it, it applies to literary or artistic works, so this can be books, this can be other types of writing, this can be music, musical compositions, painting, sculpture, architecture, uh, and computer programs. Interestingly, for example, for me, it would be probably more logical for computer programs to, for code to belong to industrial property, but it's not, so it's, it belongs to, uh, to copyright films, etc. Et 
and usually they are protected uh, uh, they, they are protected uh, for a certain period of time uh, so it, this period of time differs differs it is at least uh, 50 years in some cases it is 25 years in our countries uh, it's about 70 it's 70 years in some countries it's 100 years for some works so it depends it, it is defined by national legislation and uh, basically, uh, throughout this period, the copyright holder uh, owns the rights, can use this, can sell license, can sell whatever, can earn money using this uh, work. And then after the expiration of uh, this period, 70 years after the author's death, so persons, his uh, uh, people who inherit uh, the, the author's uh, property other properties they can also inherit uh, copyrights so after the, the death of the author this work goes into the public domain and you can see every uh, usually in january you can find news saying well this year these and these films these and these compositions these and these books will become uh, will go into the public domain and thanks to this to to this uh, to these regulations uh we have for example books uh that are in public domain and anybody can uh publish these books and uh, republish these books, reprint them or publish them on the internet. Uh, but in case, for example, these books are translated, translations are also copyrighted. Uh, it depends whether the, the translation may not always be possible. It, it may not always be possible to share, uh, to share, to reuse, to reprint the translation, because the uh, the author of the translation also uh, has some rights, and uh, so it you can republish a translation 70 years after the death of the translator. So these are regulations that are usually embedded in national uh, legislation, na national laws reg uh, relating to copyright. So we, we also have related or neighboring rights. Uh, and these are the rights of uh, performers, for example, actors, singers, musicians, musicians, uh, for example, uh, performing somebody else's work they also, their work, uh, their creations, interpretations are protected by uh, copyright as well. And another term that is very important to understand is the term license. So license is a permission to use a work in a particular way. It can be exclusive, it can be non-exclusive. And uh, the, old, the copyright holder can give license uh, to use to other people. So the, the original copyright holder is the author and the author uh, can license the work to somebody else. For example, uh, an author of a book can give a license uh, to a publisher to translate and publish the translation uh, of their book and this can be forever. Uh, it can be ex an exclusive license so this publisher can uh, publish this translation forever and or this can be non-exclusive and be, can be time limited so this is usually regulated by agreements license agreements between copyright holders and uh, and the, the users of the of the license uh, basically what you usually do when you publish uh, with international publishers commercial publishers you usually uh, give an exclusive license because they require you to do this and by giving this exclusive license uh you actually give them the right to use and you sign this most people don't just don't read don't even read uh, carefully these agreements but you basically sign off all your rights and give them the right to exploit your work until the end of the copyright term which means that you deprive yourself of the right to use it and of the right to license the work to somebody else so this is uh, the meaning of exclusive license to give rights to somebody else and uh, nobody else can use it and you, you are included in that <laughs> nobody uh, crowd uh, some more definitions and more clarifications so there are differences between uh, national laws between um, Law, legislative traditions and uh, for example there are two major I should say this is hugely simplified so there are two major traditions one is Anglo-Saxon and the other is uh, 
European continent, they call it continental. I, I don't know, don't ask me about, the, about other countries. There are different traditions in other countries, depending on uh, their local legislative tradition, on the, whose colony they were back in history. So there are many different uh, traditions. But basically, these are the most, the most common ones and the ones that you most frequently encounter. So there are there is difference. We usually say copyright, and it say uh, it's right to say uh, copyright uh, to use copy the term copyright as a general overarching term. But basically, in most European countries, uh, and it is so in our countries as well, we have the term authors' rights. So we don't really use uh, co copyright uh, when literally translated. It means the right to copy to make copies, the right to use the content by making copies. And uh, in uh, in our countries, it's authors' rights. It's the right that is owned by authors. And actually, these terms and these traditions, they they have uh, in the background. They have completely different uh, logic and different um, uh, different philosophy. So, copyright is basically uh, copyright. The origins of copyright are related to uh, the, the, the emergence of the printing press. So when the printing press uh, became reality and there were many publishers, printers, who actually made uh, mechanical mechanical copies of, uh, of, of literary works, uh, copyright the legislation was introduced to protect their, their rights. So basically, copyright focuses mostly on those uh, who invest in intellectual property, producers. For example, uh, in the US, uh, the producer is the copyright holder for a film, whereas in uh, Europe, in most European countries, the director, the creator uh, is of the work is uh, the, the copyright holder. So th this is the basic difference. Uh, basically, author's rights uh, in the continental tradition, they are related to human rights. They fall into the category of human rights. So your your right to be signed, to be credited, to uh, be cited as the author of a work is a human right. Uh, and basically in uh, this tradition, a continental tradition, you usually have a division into moral and economic rights, which is, I, I really like this division. Uh, this division means that you can't uh, actually you can't assign moral rights to anybody else. So you can sell your economic rights. You can give an uh, 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 an exclusive license. You can completely transfer the economic rights and entitle a publisher to to exploit your work, and you have no money out of it. You 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 don't you don't even you have to ask to use your work, but you cannot be deprived of your moral rights. You will always have, they always have to credit you as an author. And uh, even if, uh, for example, an author dies and uh, somebody inherits the inherits copyrights, they actually inherit economic rights. They, they are not signed as authors of this. Uh, the moral, moral rights always remain with the original author. So this is typical of, um, of continental legislation. Uh, on the other hand, in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, moral rights are less important, and someone sometimes they are not even mentioned in the law. They are not; uh, they don't even exist in in legislation, which is different. Another difference, and this is something that is uh, that that is where the people usually confuse these things. And you can hear, for example, people in European countries saying, "I'm using uh, this and this video uh, under the terms of fair use." So this is not correct because in, in uh, continental legislation, uh, fair dealing and fair use don't exist. Fair dealing is actually the use of copyright, copyrighted materials uh, for a limited uh, scope of purposes. So, for example, if you need it for uh, research, for private study, for education, if you want uh, for satire, you want to, I don't know, uh, make a, criticize it in a comic way 
or, or a serious way, or for example, you want to uh, review, make a review of a work and then you need to uh, quote uh, some pieces of the text, then you can in news reporting, etc. So this this falls under full dealing, fair dealing, and this is embedded in their legislation. So the legislation specifies that there is this uh, clause, fair dealing clause, and you can use it. Uh, there is another uh, in in various so in Anglo-Saxon countries uh, there are differences between them also. So in some countries you have fair dealing, in some countries you have fair use. Fair use is very similar to fair dealing, but it's broader. And there are many uh, litigations relating to fair use because uh, it's quite extensive and it uh, depends on interpretation. So th these are very interesting court proceedings where they discuss whether something is fair use or not. Uh, and uh, it, it's really interesting. So uh, in uh, continental legislation, we don't really have this. So it's not okay uh, to say, so this is fair use because... It's, you, you don't have a legal right to uh, to use something under fair use because it doesn't exist in your legislation. Uh, we have copyright exceptions, and they are more limited, uh, and they are defined in the legislation. So they are not that extensive as fair use, and they are also limited to temporary acts of reprodu reproduction, quotation, teaching, research, etc., private copies. And it, what is most important, uh, these are accessible formats for disabled people, with disabled peoples, people. Uh, so this is something that libraries uh, have to deal with, uh, and they have many issues. Uh, and there, there is ongoing struggle uh, because uh, publishers, commercial publishers, they they strive to limit uh, the ways uh, you can use uh, a particular work. So, for example, uh, if you want to make a book, a digital book accessible uh, to uh, people who, who are visually impaired, you will probably have some issues. There is a, now an international treaty dealing with this, uh, seeking to enable libraries to to make uh, these books accessible but there is an, an ongoing struggle not every country have accepted this and uh, publishers are trying to undermine these efforts so it's a it's a very serious concern and it's uh, yeah it falls also into the remit of human rights but uh, this is this can also be an exception and it, 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 from country to country these exceptions are uh, different so yeah there is a kind of a minimum that all of them have but some countries may give uh, may have a more extensive list of exceptions and the other countries have more limited and also there is a difference uh relating to something that is called work for hire this is uh, where where you for example you are as we all of us are we are employed with a, a public organization or a, a private uh, company and in the uh, US especially and in other Anglo-Saxon, not all Anglo-Saxon countries, but in the US especially. So if you work uh, for uh, an employer, the copyright will automatically belong to the employer. And this will be for the entire uh, duration of, of, of copyright. So this means 70 years after your death. Uh, in uh, continental legislation, not uh, not all countries, the, this, this clause doesn't exist in uh, each country. For example, I, I'm not sure whether it exists in French legislation. But for example, in Serbia, it does exist. And work for hire is limited, temporarily limited. So for example, in Serbian law, uh, if you're employed uh, and you create something, it's it's in your job description to create, to have some creative outputs these creative outputs will belong to you as an author in terms that you you will have moral rights immediately you you will be credited as an author but for the first five years your employer will have the uh, exclusive right to use uh, the work and then after the expiration of this period of five years then all the rights, the economic rights also return to you as a creator. And that's very important. Actually, many people don't really know this. So uh, so if it's not, this can be uh, defined differently. For example, in the US, this can be defined differently by, uh, by agreements between employees and employers. And this can also be defined differently uh, in 
in our countries, but basically, if it do, if it's not defined differently in uh, using by means of an agreement, then it's uh, basically uh, the, the law automatically applies. So you have this right after five, after this period. So check check your uh, copyright law after the expiration of this period. You will uh, be able to exploit fully exploit your uh, your uh, copyrights. Uh, so. So this is something, this is very practical information, and I uh, usually explain this because people tend, uh, people don't really understand when they find these notices. For some reason, I don't know, they, they are not really clear. So you, when you uh, find copyright information, it has two main parts. So you usually say, see this copyright, then you see a year when the work is copyrighted, might be the, the work the, the year when it was created but it may be a different year then you have the name of the copyright holder and after that you have usage rights usage usage conditions conditions terms of use actually so but also this is in this first case so this says that cop this work was copyrighted in this is a journal article uh, by the way, so this work was copyrighted in 1985. The copyright holder is Springer, the publisher, and all rights are reserved. When all rights are reserved, this means that uh, you can't use uh, you can't use this work without us asking uh, permission from the publisher. For example, you want to. Uh, actually for example translate this article you can't do this because this license doesn't allow this you want to deposit this work uh, in a repository and make it open access which means disseminate it further you can't do this without asking permission from the copyright holder in this case copyright holder is the publisher and uh, the publisher is the copyright holder because the original author the authors of the manuscript they signed an agreement uh, by means of which they actually gave away their rights to the publisher and they don't have the rights anymore. They they are credited, they are they they, they retain their moral rights, but the publisher uh, is if you want to ask for permission to use this work, you have to ask the publisher the copy who is the copyright holder. Uh, basically, if you don't see, if you see just the first part, copyright, or you, or you don't see anything, so you, for example, you have a website and there is no copyright notice, it is implied that all rights are reserved. So this is uh, important to highlight because in uh, in our region, we have, how to say, we lack uh, the copyright culture uh, because for many reasons, there is a kind of, it's not a legislative transition, but it's a cultural tra tradition, I should say. So when we find something on the internet, we usually uh, wrongly imply that this can be reused, but it cannot be reused. So if uh, in order to make things, and we will explain this later, in order to enable people to use your work, you have to put a license on it. You have to allow them to use. So our logic is usually, so it's not forbidden, it's allowed as long as it's not forbidden. But in terms of copyright, this is not a right logic. It's just the opposite. So if it's if the rights are not given explicitly, it's implied that they are not given, that you don't have any rights and that you have to ask permission. There is another case. Uh, so this is uh, this the, the, the second uh, copyright uh, notice is for a work that is published in open access. So you have this copyright, then you have a year, then you have the names of the copyright holders, and these copyright holders are actually authors. Sometimes it says authors instead of names, and then it says this is an open access article distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution License, and then it says uh, what the license permits. So you can, because the license is permits unrestricted use, distribution, even commercial use is allowed under this license. You don't have to ask permission because the license says you can use it and you can use it. So what is usually a problem with these copyright notices is that uh, 
um, researchers usually when they see this copyright here and here, they usually understand uh, wrongly that they can't do anything with this work. So this copyright here doesn't mean that use it, it doesn't mean yet that use is restricted. Whether use is restricted or not depends on the third element, on this one, all rights reserved, or this one, the license. So you need to know how to read those elements. So this means just this is the copyright information. This work is copyrighted. There are works, there are works that cannot be copyrighted. That don't uh, a work has to contain this creative element in order to be copyrighted. You you just can can't just make a selection of some things that are I don't know uh, don't have this creative element and say well this is a cop or mechanically reproduce something and say well I I reproduce this uh, this is copyrighted it's it's not so there are things that are not copyrightable so this means that the work is copyrightable and that there is a copyright information and that you should continue reading in order to learn how to use this uh, uh, this thing. In case this license, for example, said Creative Commons attribution non-commercial and you would like to use this work commercially, then in this case you would have to ask the copyright holder, in this case this, these are the authors, so you would have to contact the authors in order to be able to, to ask and then to get their written permission to use uh, the work. So uh, the, the first case here, transfer of copyright. So you have uh, publication agreements are usually signed uh, between authors and uh, and publishers, and this is usually so for uh, public scholarly publications, for books, for uh, scholarly articles, uh, and uh, for some reason researchers usually don't read these, uh, and they just, uh, you know, they uh, they are in position to uh, they're striving with. Uh, promotion criteria with research assessment criteria and research assessment criteria require them to publish as much as possible and also require them to publish with certain publishers who are considered prestigious publishers, good publishers, etc., which is not always the case. And then uh, they are in a position to sign off their rights. They need to publish, they need to publish with a certain publisher, they need to score some a certain amount of points, and they just sign these agreements. They don't negotiate. And they are not the problem is that they are not even aware that they can retain some rights. They are not even aware that they don't have to sign off all the rights. So we have a problem. Librarians, institutions, we all have a problem. And also researchers have a problem if there is a kind of a, a national open science policy or there is an institutional open science policy that requires them to put in a to, to deposit in a repository their works that are publicly funded because public has uh, the, the right to uh, if, if uh, you publish scholarly publications using uh, public money for your research then well public needs to have the right to to read this to to access these uh these works and they cannot because the rights are signed off and those publishers uh just lock behind the table these works and nobody can uh can access them so this is a kind of a typical uh requirement and uh there is a contract and you sign this contract and uh by the means of this contract you transfer copyright to to the, to the publisher uh, these terms may be different, so these agreements can be different. For example, you sign publication agreements uh, with um, uh, open access publishers, but in most cases these are uh, licensing agreements where you just give them the right to publish and not to... Uh, so I will show you this. This is the license to publish uh, for, a, uh, for an open access publisher, so the authors usually retain copyright of the published paper, but they just give a non-exclusive right to publish to the uh, to the publisher. And if this work is published under uh, a liberal license, I will explain this later, then anybody else can use this work. So this is a kind of uh, 
uh, more desirable option. So in case you did this transferred copyright, in most cases, you will be required to ask permission to use your own work. So, uh, for example, you published uh, an article with a commercial publisher and you signed off your rights and you need an image from your work and your th this image was created by you but you signed off your rights and you need that image to publish in a book uh, or another article you need to ask permission from the publisher because now they own the material the economic rights and you need to ask them to publish uh, your, your image so some of them uh, have in their policies they for example would reuse uh, uh, would um, allow reuse of uh, of such materials for example in phd thesis automatically some of them for example wouldn't require you to pay for this but you will probably i don't know uh, you will have to to, to ask but they they will send you the permission without asking you to pay but in some cases they will ask you to pay for example if you would like to use uh, uh, your own material your own material created by yourself but with copyright transfer to the to the publisher uh, in a commercial publication they would probably ask you to pay for this and this is well this is not fair but this is so because you you signed such an agreement uh, for most commercial publishers, those big ones, you have uh, uh, as an option this uh, copyright clearance clearance center. This is a company. Uh, to, to, to the the image on the right, the screenshot on the right. This is a company, a commercial company, and actually all those uh, publishers they outsource this company to uh, to do this copyright clearance for them. Copyright clearance means. Uh, people ask permission to use something and then they either get or don't get or get it under certain condition but there is a, a, a standardized form and then they fill out the form and uh, in case uh, this is something that publisher allows they get a written license agreement to use this particular image in this particular book not in all books they want to publish but in this particular book and they need to provide information about this particular book or a PhD thesis. Sometimes uh, it takes a bit longer because, uh, for example, if charges are involved and you need some correspondence through the system, so you log on, sign in, register, and then you sign in, it's free, and but you communicate through the system. Uh, in case of some smaller publishers uh, who are not outsourcing this company, uh, you will probably have to uh, contact the publisher. And this is usually done by means of a simple letter where you say, so I'm the original author of this uh, work and I need to reuse this, this and this. So either you want to publish the whole text or parts of the text or you need some images. You explain and you explain, you must uh, state uh, where you will be reusing it, when is the publication of this new work is due and under which condition and whether it's commercial or not. And then uh, you have to wait for some time to, uh, to get a kind of response. Sometimes they don't respond really. If they're small publishers, I had such cases that they don't respond. And one of the situations, for example, in Serbia, we have... Uh, a national open science mand open access mandate for phd th thesis and uh, uh the thesis are automatically after the the defense they are automatically uh open access they are available in the national repository so some faculties there should be all but not all of them are doing this some faculties require authors to clear the so-called third party copyrights uh, before uh, submitting a PhD thesis, because this would be an issue if a thesis is licensed under an open license and there is a, uh, an image or something that is copyrighted, uh, uh, the copyright holder can, for example, uh, require this PhD thesis to be taken down. And then you have a complicated situation, then you probably have to take it down, then you have to remove this image, which affects the integrity of the work, etc. So this is an issue, and that's it's very important uh, for students, uh, PhD students, to know uh, about, and I usually do trainings for them, to exp and I usually support them uh, practically. So they come with a list of images, and we try to do this uh, clearance. So we try to establish the origin of the work, which is sometimes very difficult. 
And for example, we first we try to identify the uh, images. Uh, these are usual images uh, uh, that are in um, published in open access uh, outputs, journals, or books. Uh, which are under uh, an open license, so we try to f identify them because for these works you don't have to ask permission, but for the other works you have to ask permission. And then in case we don't manage to clear uh, the third party rights, then my advice to researchers is to replace the image or to create their own if possible, uh, because it's, uh, it's it, this is a safe way. So it's, it's legal, it's not okay to keep... Uh, the, the materials that were we, with not clear copyrights with, without permission in a, in any work. So I explained the license to publish. Uh, so I will now explain what how you can retain some rights, even if you sign a copyright agreement with a publisher or with anybody else. So uh, in many countries, and in an increasing number of countries, we are now having uh, open access policies. And these can be national. For example, in Serbia, we have a national open science uh, policy, uh, which requires open access to scholarly publications. Uh, and uh, it allows a kind of an embargo. So you need to make your works uh, publicly available. But it, this, cannot, this doesn't have to be immediately. This can be after an embargo of, uh, in humanities. This embargo uh, is 18 months. So with, this means after eight months, your publication needs to be available uh, in open access in a repository but this can be institutional uh, policies uh, so in for example in uh, our countries are usually more centralized so it doesn't make sense for an institution to make a kind of policy if it's not aligned with a national policy but with in some other countries that are more bigger more decentralized institutional policies have a, a are more important and we also have funder policies for example the european commission is a funder and they have their own policy which requires immediate open access so e even if you have your national policy al allowing uh, an embargo if you are funded by the european commission which are the public funds of the citizens of the european union then you you can't use uh, the benefits of this embargo. You need to make your work immediately available because the funder requires so. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, this re rights retention is possible even if you you are transferring copyrights, and there are multiple ways to do this. So, for example, you can ask uh, uh, when before signing the agreement, you can say, so I need to add a clause to this agreement. There, are, I won't be explaining this now in detail, but there, there is a kind of a standardized author addendum that says, uh, okay, I'm transferring all the copyrights to the publisher, but I need to make uh, my uh, author accepted manuscript, so not the published work, but the manuscript uh, that is still not uh, uh, typeset. I need to make it available in that and that repository due to uh, uh, because I uh, need to comply with an open access policy. And in some cases, uh, uh, publishers uh, will allow you to do this because it's an individual request. It's not on a massive scale. So there are chances that they will allow this. And also, I will explain two interesting cases that are gaining uh, in topicality, especially, for example, in Bulgaria, because Bulgaria uh, last year changed its uh, copyright legislation to allow uh, to allow authors to make their works open, to, to help them actually make their works open access. So one of the options is self-archiving. That's what I explained, and that's what you always, you can do this practically always. Uh, this is an old thing. Uh, it's been around for some time. So basically, uh, the, the main thing that you need to know about is that uh, you are the owner of the manuscript. Uh, publishers, uh, when they accept manuscript for publication, they do the typesetting, they uh, design it, they put their, lo their logo on it, and they say, okay, we've in invested a lot in this, and you can't... Uh, you can't use uh, this work. This is ours. But you you actually are the owner of a manuscript. And most publishers have uh, policies that allow you to uh, actually uh, make this manuscript available uh, in a repository. Some Very often it's a non-commercial repository, so institutional repositories, okay. 
and basically you can uh, you can do this after an embargo period. Sometimes it's without an embargo, but it's usually an embargo, and sometimes this embargo is quite long. It's two years, three years, and even more. Uh, so you basically need to check uh, general websites, but there is this database, Sherpa Romy, and you go there and uh, check whether you can do this. But uh, in the humanities, people tend to uh, publish more in... Uh, national journals so in national journals uh if national journals are open access so in our countries they are mostly open access you you won't really have to do this so this is what you do when you publish with commercial publishers and this usually doesn't apply for books commercial publishers are very very restrictive about books so there is another thing that is uh, uh, now uh, implemented in the european union because uh, there is this uh, coalition S thing. This is a coalition on funder, of funders and European Commission is a part of this coalition and uh, they uh, require all the works, the publications to be immediately available in open access either by uh, depositing, uh, publishing in an open access, in an open access journals and this must be under the CC BY license. I will explain this license. This is the license that allows everything including commercial use and uh this can be this can also be an author accepted manuscript so this is this version that is not yet typeset so you can deposit the manuscript in a repository any repository and this needs to be under the cc by license and most publishers don't allow this so the coalition s has developed the with with legal experts, uh, in cooperation with legal experts, they developed rights retention strategy, which says, so if your funder requires you to publish under a certain license, and your publisher, if your publisher is the European Commission, European Commission requires you to retain all the rights and to publish under uh, uh, this license, this by, then you uh this is considered to be a prior license an obligation that has legal precedence precedence over any uh agreements that you sign with publishers so if you put a license on your manuscript and the publisher is informed that you need you have this kind of obligation this is uh, uh you can actually uh this has legal precedence and you can later publish your manuscript in the repository under this license although the public publisher self archiving policy says something else so this is quite complicated and uh there is a uh, strug struggle there is a fight between publishers and funders about this topic there are also institutional policies especially in the uk requiring rights retention so this is an ongoing story i don't expect you to understand the details now but it's very important to understand that there are uh oh there is always a possibility to retain some rights and that we need to develop a different copyright culture that uh empowers authors where authors are, because they feel helpless, they feel blackmailed. So if I don't sign this agreement, uh, they won't, won't be publishing my, my article and then I won't be able to, I don't know, uh, get a higher uh, rank or get, uh, I don't know, get promoted. So basically, it's very important to be aware that you have some rights. And even if you don't understand uh, what rights retention means, just remember that you have some rights and go and ask either librarians or legal experts and they will help you retain your rights. Uh, secondary publishing rights, this is for, uh, especially interesting in Bulgaria because Bulgaria changed their uh, legislation in a number of countries. There are seven or eight countries in Europe that uh, have these clauses in the national legislation, which is similar to rights retention. It also uh, has this prior license uh, moment because your, your publisher, national publisher, requires that all the works that are publicly funded must be available in open access and in bulgaria bulgaria is the first country uh, to have a zero embargo so they have to be published immediately uh in open access so you can publish the author accepted manuscript that is not typeset immediately in a repository and the mechanism is basically the same so also you don't need to know the details but just know that you have some rights uh, there is another interesting thing that is especially interesting for you because you are using the photos of some uh, 
you can ob objects, artworks, etc. So there is a thing that I I became aware of this uh, quite late. Uh, that is called freedom of panorama. So these are clauses in the copyright law allowing or disallowing, if, if there are not such provisions in the law, to take photographs and to make them public of uh, artworks. So, for example, if you have a building that uh, is in public space and the architect of this building is still alive or has died but the period of 70 years hasn't expired yet, then if you make a photo of that building, and that building is in Greece, for example, which doesn't have this clause, freedom of panorama clause in their law, you won't, wouldn't be able to uh, publish, uh, to make this photo public, to use it in certain contexts. For example, it's usually non-commercial etc. Or you won't be able to use it at all. So th this map shows the countries that, for example, those green ones, they are more liberal, they allow more. Uh, and those, uh, for example, some of them, uh, for example, those yellows, they uh, allow uh, copyright, uh, using non-commercial non -commercial use only. For example, I wouldn't be able, if I took a photo of a building where the architect is still alive, and the building is in France, I wouldn't be able to put this image in this presentation because my presentation is uh, under a license that allows commercial use. So it's quite tricky, but you need to know, so you need to check whether the the, the, the work you, you took the photo of is still in copyright uh, uh, and in which country it is. So this is something that you need to be aware of. And also there is this thing called public domain, I already mentioned it, and there are two ways actually to provide public domain. One is to uh, to wait for uh, the, the copyright term to expire. There are also some works, for example, that uh, uh, were created before uh, the, before the emergence of uh, copyright legislation, for example, Renaissance works, Shakespeare, so they are in public domain automatically. Not the translations of these works, but these works, original works, are in public domain automatically. So this is one way. And there is the other way is by giving a license, by actually favoring some, uh, waiving some rights, uh, the, 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 the monetary rights, the economic rights. So this is this license, this is zero. I will explain, I will mention it later again. So I, as an author, for example, publish my photo on a website and I put this license which says public domain dedication and anybody can use this uh, image and they don't even have to credit me because I, I allow this, because I put that license on my work. So this is the, the public domain and basically in, when something is in public domain, you don't have to ask permission. You can use it in any way, you can use it even commercially. So for example, you can uh, print Shakespeare's work and sell them. Uh, if it's not a particular translation that is still under copyright, so you can you can do this because it's in public domain. And there is this uh, interesting tool link where you can check what is in public domain or not. So uh, public domain uh, differ differs uh, depending on on uh, national legislation. So in some countries it is it after fifty years. So for example, it's possible that the work that is uh, in public domain in the US, for example, is not in public domain in other countries because the uh, copyright, uh, this duration of copyright term is longer in some other countries. Uh, so another complicated thing that is also related to artworks and pictures of artworks, and it may also be relevant for you. For example, if you're using photos of uh, epigraphic materials, so this is quite a tricky area, and uh, the legislation is not yet harmonized in, the, in this area. So basically, uh, if uh, an artwork is uh, in public domain, a Renaissance image, technically you can uh, take a photo of this work. Uh, so for example, if uh, there is a, 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 I don't know, an antique painting uh, in a public space outside, Outdoors, you can take a photo of it, and if it's your photo, you can publish your photo. But if you found if you found a photo that was taken by somebody by somebody else of the same monument, 
and the author is still alive or hasn't died 70 years ago, then you won't be able to do this. So you would probably have to ask the author of this photograph to, uh, to use this. There are discussions saying that, well, this is a kind of, uh, you know, a photo of uh, an artwork. This is a kind of technical reproduction, so it doesn't contain this author element, this creative element. So this is disputable. So if you are using this, then you should keep it on the safe side and ask permission. Uh, sometimes uh, artworks are protected by copyright. For example, uh, you have a painter a painting and the painter... Uh, died 50 years ago and then while well, it's still copyrighted then you can't uh, you can't make a, you can't make public uh, you can't use a reproduction but basically if the artworks uh, this first case when artworks in a museum and although they are uh, they are in public domain the artworks there are restrictions that can be set by museums, and they are usually set by the museums because museums are exploiting these works, and they are owners, and they can do set limitations by um, terms of use. So you probably won't be able to use it. So I had I put an example here. So for example, I made a photo of a painting in a museum, but I couldn't put this photo here because this presentation will be publicly, it's now publicly disseminated and it can be used commercially. So I couldn't put the photo here because there are limitations set by the museum's terms of uh, terms of use. So this is really, really complicated. And uh, if you're creating a database that contains uh, photos that are taken by somebody else, then you need to take care of copyright clearance. So you need to check who the author of the photo is and uh, to ask permission to use it or not. And also, uh, you, if it is in a museum, also you need to ask permission uh, to use it. Uh, there are still ongoing discussion. This is a huge uh, issue and there are still ongoing discussions about this. So this legislation will probably uh, change and will probably become more, more uh, open, more liberal. But at the moment, it's quite, quite complicated. Uh, so licenses in the digital environment, we are now coming to the COP to the Creative Commons licenses that, that were probably mentioned uh, during the previous days. So when the digital environment appeared with the rise of Internet, and not only the Internet, but pre before the Internet, we had some, some digital uh, media containing some digital content, content uh, there was a need, uh, the need to, to have something more standardized became uh, apparent. Because, for example, I, I already mentioned, you want to give a license to somebody to use your work in a particular way, for example, to copy it, to make it available on their website, etc. So this is done by means of uh, an agreement, a uh, written agreement. And uh, so this means that if you have uh, something on the website and there is all rights reserved or there is nothing, people need to ask you. Each person who wants to use it, each institution who wants to use it needs to write to you and then you need to provide a written agreement saying, I allow, I entitle you to use this in this, this, in this way, which is time consuming and yeah, was difficult. You would probably need some uh, legal advice and, and to pay to a legal expert to help you. So that's why those standardized machine readable licenses that you just, you know, you deposit a photo uh, on Wikimedia Commons and you just select a license from a drop-down menu and it's assigned. So you are depositing in, uh, Dragon, I will show you later, you are depositing in Zenodo. Then you just select a license from a drop-down menu and it's assigned. And it has a power of a written agreement because it's standardized, it's developed by legal experts, and it's also, it's very interesting, it's enforceable by law. So it has the same strength, uh, the same meaning as a written license signed by, by, by the parties. Uh, basically, uh, these licenses work, I, I've already explained this, so if a license allows something, for example, commercial use, you don't have to ask you can use it commercially. You, there is no need to write to the to the copyright holder. But if the license doesn't permit this, this doesn't mean that this is not allowed at all. You need to ask. So, for example, the copyright holder might allow you 
to to use this or might require you to pay but you can still ask so that's very important to know that you can always ask and there is also this kind of copyright copyleft principle it was developed in the software development of our environment uh, where you actually grant uh, certain freedoms over copyrighted works but in a way that uh those who are using these works have to perpetuate this license so they have to grant the same rights to other users so for example if i uh i'll explain this on the example of creative commons licenses so it, these creative commons licenses are standardized licenses they were developed in 2002 uh, so it's clear that they are actually made for, for a digital environment and they are usually used. You can use uh, this license for a print work, but only if this print work is available online. So uh, they have these simple uh, images that indicate some conditions. So these conditions, this person here, means that you need to attribute work to this is to to respect somebody's moral right so you have to credit somebody as an author and all of these licenses have this condition even the more liberal ones they have this condition except for the uh cc0 which is actually dedication public domain dedication so you need to credit the person so uh then this one non-commercial means that the work can be reused but non-commercially and then you have various combinations so, for example, this work can be used non-commercially and it can be even translated and uh, put to, to another media, etc., converted to another media, but as long as it's not commercial and as long as the author is credited. But if you have this uh, sign, this means that the work can be used only as it is. So you can't make translations, for example, of this work. So these combinations give different licenses, which are cover quite much and then you have this diagram showing what is allowed and what is not allowed so i i will now explain this copyright copyleft thing so for example if i put this license creative commons cc by this means that my work can be used commercially so this presentation that you are now watching uh is under this license and you can if you wish you can use this uh, presentation you can print it and you can sell the, what, the 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 printed versions or you can sell uh the the digital versions of of this present this very same presentation and i don't mind i i allow this i put the license that allow this but if i put this uh license that says share alike this means that uh yet you can sell this presentation uh, the, the the new the new work but you have still to share it under the same license so that other people can use it we are now wikipedia and all wiki projects they use this license this, this is a copyleft license basically they are using this license and i i must say that this is my preferred uh, license but i'm using uh, uh cc by because it's uh i understand that it's easier it makes it easier for other people to use my work for example if you, if you want to post uh, uh, this presentation on a website uh, that is using uh, uh, that is publishing advertisements and if you're using a kind of free hosting option then you will probably have advertisements if i put non-commercial then you wouldn't be able to use it there and i want you to be able to use it there because you don't have money to pay professional hosting so i'm using this liberal license open license the most open license for the sake of convenience and this is the license that is recommended by for example the european commission as a publisher also i always use this cc0 license for metadata and this is also relevant for you for example if you're creating a, a repository it's very important to share the metadata under this uh, license because uh if you're not selling this metadata, then it's beneficial for you because huge systems, huge aggregators, they don't really have, they don't bother asking you permission to use or not to use. 
So if you want to be harvested by those big, uh, big uh, aggregators, then it's convenient for you. If you're not selling the metadata, it's convenient for you to, to use this license that actually enables them to, uh, to share further, to disseminate further, to process your data. So that's why I recommend using this uh, license. And there is the de a declaration uh, was signed some days ago about uh, scholarly information in Barcelona, which actually requires this license to be used in national CRIS systems repositories, et, et cetera, having this metadata thing in in them, not, not, the, not the full text. So basically, uh, I will explain another thing that I identified as particularly co confusing for uh, for researchers, so I have some text in Serbian here. I don't understand why, but it doesn't matter. I will re remove it. So basically, uh, you also have three elements here, uh, three pieces of information for each license. Uh, so you have this image. This image is reflected in the first part. So it's not that these three details are actually reflected in the image. No, this image refers only to the per first part. And it says CC Creative Commons. OK, this is a type of the license. Then you have attribution. This is this this person here. OK, let's move back. And then this non-commercial. So these are the conditions of the license. This is called the license module. So these are this module. These are license modules. So this is the license module. License module actually defines how the work, this is crucial, and it, it explains how a license, how a work can be used. Then you have something that is licensed versions. License develop because the environment develops. And then there are multiple licensed versions. We are now at version four. Uh, so there sometimes, well, you have those legacy licenses. So this indicates the version. This version re almost never uh, changes the in these conditions. So basically, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's four or f three. These conditions are the same. So this is something that people don't understand. They sometimes think that this actually, this version determines the conditions of use. It doesn't really. It's the first part. And then you have the name of the country. Here it's Serbia. Here it's international. This is called jurisdiction because uh, up to the version, version 4, there were uh, local translations of the license and there were local adaptations of the Creative Commons licenses. And this was done uh, because uh, people wanted to align them with the national legislation because they need to be legally enforceable. Now it's not recommended anymore. So uh, version 4 doesn't have these, um, it can have translations, but it doesn't really have those uh, different jurisdictions. It's international. And also uh, what is new in this la uh, four, version 4, so this CC0 actually didn't exist before uh, before version 4. So this is something that is you don't even have to remember. But basically, it's important to understand and remember that this first part and these images actually determine the conditions of use. Uh, it's, these licenses, Creative Commons licenses, they're very, very convenient. They're very widespread. They're probably the most widespread among among uh, open licenses. And uh, there is, uh, if you don't really know which license to apply, there is this chooser, and you go there and you answer a set of questions. There is a form, you answer a set of questions, and then you get the license generated. Uh, depending on what, and the questions are very simple. So then you can copy this license and you even get a code, a HTML code that you can paste on your website. So it's really very, very uh, convenient. And in most repositories, these licenses are uh, in institutional repositories, you just, they're embedded, technically embedded, you just select them from the, because somebody else has done this before you, uh, and you just select them from a drop down list. Uh, and this is how they look. So they have three layers and they actually have the same uh, power. So there is a legal code behind them. So there is a text and this text contains all the elements of uh, a contract between a licensing contract uh, between uh, a copyright holder and the licensee, the person. So in this case, you as an author give the license to everybody else uh, to use and this is the contract that is actually automatically generated. It is uh, ready-made. It's it's technically enabled by by those who who created this these licenses. 
and there is the explanation how to use this. Uh, I suppose to those licenses, there are different licenses for software. So you can, technically you can use a Creative Commons license for software, depending on the repository, but they are not the most convenient. Uh, software licenses actually they started to develop before uh, before Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons licenses are a kind of a derivative of it's not the right word, but they they are actually they were inspired by software licenses, and uh, software licenses started to develop in the late nineteen seventies nineteen eighties, and that's where this copy left culture, uh, where you actually take care that people reusing uh, in the future your work can reuse it and that uh, a company cannot close the code and say now you can't develop this anymore so this culture of open uh, uh, copyleft culture it actually emerged in, emerged in the software software environment so there are many such licenses and uh, usually if you have software code, these licenses are usually uh, they are machine readable, so they are embedded in the code and you are required not to change this piece of code, crediting all the previous uh, contributors or, or original authors of, of the software. They are quite, quite complicated. So they are quite complicated even for, for people developing software, let alone uh, us. But it's good to know that, that they are different and that you, they are publicly available, so you can check them. Also, there are some other data licenses. I only mentioned one. This is Open Data Commons. It's very similar to this copyleft license, uh, city by share alike. So de it depends on the repository. So some repositories have this license embedded in it. Uh, but this is adjustable. Yeah, people developing repositories can choose which licenses to embed. So now there is a, a new emerging issue. Uh, I don't know much about this. Uh, so we all... Uh, last year, we were all a bit a kind of uh, in a state of shock with the emergence of these chatbots. And then actually, uh, although uh, artificial intelligence has been has existed for, for a while, for decades, uh, as a concept or as a specific piece of, of software, uh, it's only with the chatbots and with their public availability that actually the Pandora box uh, was opened. And uh, now we are having uh, very fervent discussions and we are having uh, legislation developed uh, all over the world trying to address this. We have uh, recommendations relating to, uh, to publishing. Uh, trying to regulate the use of artificial intelligence. So basically, uh, I recommend here using this very simple, it's, it's been published weeks ago, uh, this uh, document, it has about 16 pages and it's uh, developed by the by WIPO. And uh, it actually highlights some of the challenges. So which are the challenges related, for example, to the use of generative artificial intelligence? So generative artificial intelligence, these are tools that actually create something new. So they don't, don't just process data, but they create something that can be considered original. It's disputable whether, and this is a, a part of these discussions, but there's something that looks different than what you already have. So, for example, if you're using a, a chatbot, a, ch a chatbot can create, uh, can communicate with you. Uh, well, it's also disputable whether we should consider this communication or not, but they they produce pieces of text that look original. They are pre-trained. Uh, they are using, reusing materials that somebody put into them when training them. And one of the legal issues related to co to intellectual property is whether uh, these materials put used during the training of those uh, artificial intelligence tools they are probably copyrighted. So whether uh, the they, the creators of these tools had the right to use these uh, materials. So this is a huge issue, and there are several uh, several cases on the. The, the, trying to be resolved on uh, the court, so the litigation is going on in many places. Publishers uh, uh, sued uh, these companies, uh, 
creating those tools. Another issue related to copyright is whether you should credit uh, the artificial intelligence tool. So, for example, if you are writing a, a summary of something and you are using this text in a blog post, in a, in a research paper, etc., whether you should credit, uh, I said, so some legislations, most legislations say that no, a machine cannot uh, be a tool, cannot be an author, cannot be considered an author because they are not legally accountable. They cannot be copyright holders. They cannot license uh, uh, the rights to somebody else. But it seems to me that the UK uh, legislation is going towards uh, recognizing those tools as potential copyright holders. So this is an open an open issue. Uh, so basically, uh, current recommend recommendations of uh, publishers and the associations of journal publishers and publishers, uh, scholarly publishers in general, say that uh, the, the uh, tool cannot be considered uh, a copyright holder, but that you need to uh, be very transparent about, uh, when, when, uh, and very honest, and you should indicate whether you've used such tools or not. And also another thing that is important that because these tools are using potentially copyrighted materials, it is possible that what you get as uh, an output from them, the text that they generate, it can contain pieces of other texts that are copyrighted, and this is there is a risk of plagiarism accusation. So this material can be recognized as plagiarized, and plagiarism is usually associated uh, with uh, copyright infringement, and then sometimes uh, if you use uh, a lo longer pieces of somebody's text, then this is copyright infringement, and which is, uh, in the West, it's more severe than plagiarism, because you can be sued for this at the court. So there are many, many uh, elements, and there are many open issues relating to this. I highly recommend uh, uh, using, using this reading and using this uh, manual, and uh, actually keeping an eye on the developments in this area, because these recommendations tend to change, and we are we uh, are still expecting the major legislation relating to this. Uh, European uh, Union is working on this a lot, and uh, the problem with this uh, generative AI tools is that we don't really know everything about them. They are not very transparent, and we don't really know how they uh, they work. And uh, there are some issues. We, at this moment, we can't even identify all the potential issues related to intellectual property. Uh, that's basically all that I have to say. Now I'm sh sharing this slide because you have some resources there. And some of these resources are actually uh, a bit uh, more um, include some other sources. So, for example, uh, about rights retention, you have a selection of sources. So, this is not only one resource, that is links. And uh, that's all.